term. So, hi everyone. So, thank you to join this uh, session, a special session for the seminar in which uh, a PhD student, postdoc, and uh, uh, a research engineer can present shortly what they are doing uh, to this seminar. Uh, we have this kind of meeting each uh, beginning of month uh, for the moment. Uh, the first, so the people who will talk today are uh, Stefano Yelamo, who is engineer in Telecom Paris uh, on uh, wireless network. Ibo Kwan, who is PhD student at Telecom Paris on wireless network. Maxine Renal, who is PhD student at Nokia on graph theory and machine learning techniques. Barat Roy Shuduri, who is PhD student at INRIA uh, on network theory. Michael Davidoff, who is PhD student at INRIA on network theory. Saye Kanyea, who is a PhD student at, uh, on network theory, a PhD student at INRIA. And finally, Pierre Popino, PhD student at INRIA on network theory. So, Stefano, you can start uh, with your presentation now. Thank you, Ludovic. Uh, I will share my screen. Yeah, share your screen. So I had to change my presentation at the very, very last minute. I wanted to present you something that it's in the process of being uh, patented, but then I didn't have the green light uh, from Telecom Paris. Uh, and so I will uh, tell you something about what I did in the last months with the Telecom, Telecom Paris. Um, okay. So I will uh, tell you something about uh, new technology for indoor connectivity to connect um, difficult indoor spaces and unserved rural areas. Um, I will follow the structure uh, suggested by Anna. Uh, so I will tell you a few facts. I will give you some hints on the, how um, uh, we, thought about solving this problem and then very few results. Um, so the uh, relevance and challenges, uh, just a couple of facts, the 90% of mobile internet connections are made indoor and 80% of mobile internet traffic is consumed indoor. It comes without saying that the indoor quality of service is key for com customers retention and acquisition of mobile network operators. Uh, however, uh, regardless of the fact that the technology is progressing and we are doing lots of optimization and stuff, still indoor radio coverage is a major challenge, both in urban and rural areas. It is, in fact, very difficult to forecast, you know, the thickness of the, the walls, the propagation paths, and uh, many other uh, difficulties. And uh, as a result, is quite common, maybe not, you know, in very, very downtown because the densification of the cells is quite high. But if you guys go out of Paris, I'm sure that some of you and many of you have experienced low data rates and spotty connections uh, while indoor in uh, uh, suburban areas as well, and perhaps mostly in the, in the countryside. The thing is, are getting even worse because new standards are coming for the thermal efficiency of building. And uh, for example, in France, there is this HQE new standard, um, which uh, it's uh, basically a new protection, which can be, uh, it's put like on the, uh, on the external walls. It allows to increase quite a lot of efficiency, but it blocks most of the radio waves. These are well-known problem, for example, in the uh, Palaiso new building where um, Telecom Paris Tech, uh, Telecom Suite Paris are, where indoor the connections are really poor. Uh, another example is in uh, Italy, where I put here, the uh, government is um, actually refunding the 110% of the expenses 
if you put this kind of uh, thermal protections uh, against the external walls. And uh, just to give you a very little overview of what this is about. So this is, as you see, like the external walls and you apply a kind of uh, new layers for a, a, a superior insulation. Um, so how we came out to solve this problem, um, here is just uh, a few use cases. Um, so we uh, use external uh, aerial TV, TV antennas that you can see on the rooftop of uh, any houses in France and in many other countries. And to put the um, band 28 LTE antenna whose rollout has not happened yet, only on TV towers. By doing so, we get big cells serving all the indoor spaces as well as outer spaces. But anyway, it's mostly dedicated to indoor spaces. And uh, these external antennas are already designed to receive uh, radio frequencies in this frequency band. I remind you that the band 28 is the one going from uh, uh, 694 megahertz up to uh, 750, more or less. So it's around the 700 megahertz. We just plug our um, set of box, which can be a simple repeater or also uh, a more complex uh, relay. And then we just repeat the signal indoor. Uh, one might wonder at once, but why are you doing that? How are you able to return the signal? So our technology includes two um, variants. One is to use the TV antenna as also a transmitter. And the other is to use a 3GPP um, functionality, uh, which is called uplink, downlink, decoupling, which allows the uh, internal device to return the uh, transmission to another base station. So as you see, like in the, um, for example, the top right figure, you see that we receive band 28 um, from the TV tower, and then we return the signal to another base station, which is probably the nearest base station in even another bandwidth. Um, so, Several um, instances can be thought with this. We can do channel aggregation. We, then do, we can do channel bonding. We can do, um, um, we can do a channel um, switch. Like inside, we can um, translate the channel into another frequency. And uh, there are also like some kind uh, other use cases. So if you then want to go into details, I will be happy to, to answer the, the question. This was quite a long project and it's very mature. Um, so I would not have time to, uh, to show you all the simulators that I developed and the prototypes and stuff. I will just show you the results of the prototypes. So I did test uh, this in Italy, in my hometown. And um, this you can see like on the left hand side, an example, it was in the basement of a house, which was located around 2.5 kilometers far from the main base station serving the village. The connections was mostly absent, very spotty. And when I was able to, um, to calculate the data rate, as you can see, it was uh, one point around like one megabit per second in downlink and the 0 0.16 in uplink. And also the jitter and the ping was very poor. Uh, on the right hand side, I will show you the, how things changed when I uh, used the two prototypes I, I had assembled. As you can see, the uh, downlink data rate goes up to almost 40 megabit, megabit per second. And also the uh, upload um, speed went up and uh, jitter and ping, as you can see, uh, are quite enhanced. Just as I reminded the prototype two, um, use the TV aerial as a transmitter. And the prototype one, it's the one only 
uh, using uplink, downlink, decoupling. So in the center, I can show you the transition uh, of the uh, RSRP. And uh, so you can see that right away, the, um, when I plug the prototype, the performance, the received quality and uh, uh, power of signals, they, they get a sudden increase. On the uh, right hand side, yes, yeah, sorry, before I invert is the one on the right hand side where I use also the antenna as, as a transmitter. And in fact, the upload uh, speed goes up to 20 megabit per second. The one on the left hand side is the one with uplink, downlink, decoupling. Um, so I know this is not uh, much. These were only three slides, so I couldn't show like almost anything. Uh, so these are the questions that I often get, but I will be happy to uh, answer like any other question to show you uh, pictures and the prototypes or whatever. Thanks, Stefano. Uh, just a first question uh, for, did you receive my message when I was uh, on the chat? Uh, uh, maybe I'm not, not sure. No, no, in fact, you were a bit long, in fact. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. You should have interrupted uh, so me. I, I, so I sent some message. Uh, 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 apparently, you didn't see uh, so then. Uh, sorry about it. Uh, so uh, any question in the audience? Well, there is no time for one question. Maybe. No question. So has also to leave us a bit earlier. So. Okay. okay. Oh, sorry, Anna. I was just saying, uh, Stefano has to leave us yeah. uh, pretty soon. So oh. if ah, okay. from the audience, uh, so, yeah. questions. Yeah. Maybe I just will ask one question. <laughs> Uh, short question. Uh, I do not understand why do you need some relay of uh, of the for the radio uh, with your smart smartphone? Is it for a phone call or is it for data transfer? Uh, because for data transfer, we already have the possibility to directly uh, connect to the Wi-Fi. Uh, yes, in this case, we are talking about four G. 4G connection. So it can be, for example, in rural areas that you don't have Wi-Fi at all, that you don't have any kind of connectivity. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I will have to, to look again at, at your presentation. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, uh, sorry, but we, so now we need to, to move to the next speaker, Ibo. Ibo okay. Hi. And, uh, and so, Ivo, uh, I will also send uh, on the chat for, for you uh, when uh, there is one minute left and if you are too long. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, excuse me, could you please give me the, the right to share the screen? Because stop right now. Share the, uh, so, stop share the screen, uh, Stefano. You need to stop. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Okay, so uh, it's all right. So thank you. So thanks for having me here to give you some presentation about the works that I, that I have done last year together with my two supervisors, Jean Marquis from Hunch Labs and Marcel Kubshu from the Telecom Paris. And uh, this work will also be presented in the conference IEEE ICC this summer. Yeah. And uh, as we all know, the device to device communications allows the direct communication between the nearby devices. So the post polar networks will be a very classical net, uh, model to characterize this uh, communication. Generally, people use the stochastic geometry to characterize uh, spatial randomness and analyze the performance of such kind of communication, but uh, they neglect uh, the temperature randomness of, of such kind of networks. So thanks for from some PCB and is uh, a, a, a spatial process for uh, network is proposed in 2017, which combines the spatial, uh, the stochastic geometry as well as the curing theory. And specifically, the D2B transmitter receiver pairs will arrive in this plan in this networks 
either some random positions, either random time instant. And uh, as shown in this figure one, the cross represents the receivers, which will be uniformly distributed. In, um, and um, its transmitters will also be uniformly distributed around the circle centered at these receivers. And the radius will be key is a constant in our studies. And uh, the rival time instance of these pairs will also follow the Poisson distribution with some, uh, in, uh, some intensity lambda i's. And um, at uh, each time instant key, so we can uh, formulate these positions of these pairs at a special point process phi key. Once a pair of the device arrives, it will start to transfer some fail, and the fail size will also be a random size, which follows an exponential distribution. The, when the fail transmission is finished, these device pairs will also leave the plan immediately. Okay. So our, my main work is to adapt a beamforming model, which is based on the uniform linear array to such kind of process for both the transmitter side as well as the receiver side. And the figure four here shows the schema of the uniform linear array, where these arrays are aligned in a line, the some uh, equal distance key here. And uh, here in the figure two, I show the, uh, the power gain of this uniform linear array beamforming model. We can find that uh, these, uh, right, uh, these right curves, right solid curves, shows the real power gain of this uniform linear array. And uh, this dotted lens is a simplified model that I use to model this, this beamforming model. And here the Gmax is a main beam organ, and Gmin is a side beam organ. And omega is the half power beam wise. And I uh, use n to note the number of the antenna elements. So with this model, I can also represent uh, the value of the gain, Gmax and Gmin, as well as the half power beam wise omega as a function of the number of the antenna elements, n, as shown in these formulas here. And uh, the critical rival rate is defined as the uh, uh, rival rate lambda c, uh, which is a threshold of the rival rate such that the spatial process process factor can be stable if and only if the rival rate lambda is less than the critical rival rate lambda c. Uh, based on our beamforming paradigm, I redefine this critical rival rate uh, for our model. And I give this expression for this uh, critical rival rate model, where B is a bandwise, and L of T is a Pascal function, N is a number of the elements, and L, the, um, the bigger L here, denotes the mean fail size, and A is the integration value of all the, uh, all the Pascal function. And I can also represent uh, the expectation of the uh, gain uh, power gain T n as a function of the number of antenna elements n. So our theorem is this uh, the uh, assuming the approximated uniform linear array beamforming model with n antenna elements. If the rival rate lambda is larger than the critical rival rate lambda C BFON, the spatial process process factor admits no stationary region. And uh, by my simulation, I come from our, uh, our uh, my my theorem. Well, we can observe that uh, the sample path with this intensity function beta t, which is uh, defined as the mean number of its transmitter receiver pairs per unit surface in the plan. Um, if the time average value of this uh, beta t uh, comes to be some constant, uh, we can say that uh, the system phi t is, uh, is a gothic, time gothic. As shown in this figure, here, the right uh, curves represent the time average of this beta t. And we can find that for the figure A, with the rival rate lambda is less than the critical rival rate lambda c d f, there, uh, there is a limit of these curves. So the system is stable. And when lambda is larger than lambda c of df, we can find that the system is not stable. I then I uh, I can al I also show the um, the relationship between the critical rival rate uh, without being forming lambda c uh, and uh, the lambda c bf with b forming 
we can find that uh, there is a great gain with the B forming and uh, the uh, the uh, stability uh, region is, uh, is greatly expanded because, uh, by, by this B, B forming model. When the number of antenna elements n goes to be 20, we can find the gain goes to be thousands, which is very dramatic. And that's all, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ivo. So you were also a bit long, <laughs> just for your information. Uh, it was six minutes. Uh, so any questions? One time for one or two questions maximum. <laughs> yes, I, I have a question and a recommendation. So in my case, I'm not familiar with wireless networks. Mm -hmm. And my recommendation would be do not uh, hope to enter in the detail of the model in a presentation of uh, three or five minutes because it's too short. Okay. And my main problem is, uh, as I'm not familiar, I did not understand the problem that you try to solve. So what do you try oh, okay. to optimize? Uh, for which goal? What is the industrial problem? What is the human problem? I'd like to understand uh, the context of your research before entering in the detail of the model. OK, sorry, sir. Uh, no problem. <laughs> I gave you too, too much details here. So basically, there is a special process, process model uh, and here. I mean that uh, first, uh, there are, um, these uh, transmitter receiver pairs will arrive in this space uh, at, you, uh, at some random time instant. Uh, and I will characterize this process by, by, some, uh, by some stochastic process. Uh, mm -hmm. like, uh, so so you are rather in a delay tolerant network? In a, what kind of network are, are you trying to, to, to cover and for which kind of applications? Uh, for drugs to drugs communication. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so, sorry, my, my question might, might seem stupid, but uh, you should start, in my opinion, uh, your talk by uh, explaining the context. It would be my main recommendation. Otherwise, your slides are very nice and very complete. And thank you for all your work. Uh, so, so, so my main goal is to apply the informing to this device to device communication mm -hmm. and uh, try to expand uh, the capacity with this such kind of network. Okay, okay, now it's more clear. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think we need to go to the next uh, speaker. So the next speaker is uh, uh, Maxime. Okay. So, also, Ibo, so yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Uh, does everybody see my screen? Not yet. Ah. Yes, we yeah. see the screen. Uh, so hello, I'm Maxime Reynal, uh, and today I'm going to briefly present you my PhD subject and the work that my supervisors and I have done so far on it. Uh, I will not really have time to dive into details, but hopefully you will have a clear idea of what we are working on. Uh, so the vision, uh, if we can characterize this PhD with a vision, this vision for now is automatic passing. Uh, and, and why is that? Uh, it's because we're in 2021 and somehow everybody still write their own parsers. Uh, I think all of you here have been writing parsers. Uh, when the scale of the logs and raw text to analyze becomes industrial. It creates problem known as data lake. And we cannot pass our data. We cannot really exploit it. So that's a problem we are trying to solve. Uh, so I'm, pre I'm going to present you uh, the first step we've done towards it, uh, which is the pattern distance. Uh, the pattern distance consists in studying a string uh, not at the character level, like we do usually. Like if you want to compare two strings, you're going to run the Levenstein distance at the character level. We want to compare strings at the pattern level. We want to compare their structure. Uh, so that's what the pattern distance does. So high level, more or less, we transform the strings into graphs, which represent uh, their pattern, the patterns they exhibit. So instead of having a sequence of symbol, we have a graph representing different patterns observed in the string. 
And then we extend edit distance algorithm, uh, edit distance like Levenstein distance, Smith Waterman, things like that. We extend this algorithm so they don't work only with strings, they work with the graphs, this pattern automaton, which represent the patterns. We extract then a pattern distance from extending this algorithm. And now we can compare strings at the pattern level. Uh, we derived clustering algorithm from this new distance and we validated them experimentally. Uh, they work really well on real data sets uh, of logs. We've done another thing uh, so far. It's a prototype uh, because we want to automate parsing. So we've built an automatic parser. The, the objective is simple. We want a fully automatic and fully explainable parser. Uh, it, it's really not easy to build one. So the prior knowledge is only a collection of universal patterns. For instance, if you want to pass logs, we're going to give it integers, float, IP address, things like that. We give it raw text and the output is the past JSON file. That, uh, that's what we want to build. So we've built one so far, we want to make it better. Uh, so to sum up, uh, the first work we've done, the pattern distance uh, has been accepted for Algotel 21. And we've also submitted it to the ESA 21. Now we are going to work uh, more on grammatical inference because now that we can study the structure of strings with the basic blocks, which are universal patterns, we want to infer uh, more precise grammar representing what we are trying to pass. We want to infer the grammar. Uh, for that, we are going to have two approach, genetic programming and neural network. Uh, and of course, we're going to keep on working uh, on our prototype. Uh, so who knows, one day maybe it's going to be embedded in everybody's text editor and you won't write any, any more parser ever. Uh, so that is all. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Well, thanks, Maxime. Uh, uh, perhaps a short question. Uh, yeah. could, could you explain a little bit more on the mm -hmm. uh, uh, how you move to how you use graph theory and what type of graph theory tools you use. I've not followed that. It was too short to me. Um, basically, the classic edit distances, uh, we, we very often use dynamic programming to solve them. But uh, these dynamic programming matrix, which we store results, I don't know if you see what I mean. Like, how to put it? Like, let's say we can reduce uh, edit distance problem to the problem of a shortest path uh, in a special graph that we call the edit graph. Uh -huh. And initially, the classic algorithm build the edit graph as a sort of product of two strings. And we extended this algorithm so that the edit graph, instead of being built as a product of two strings, is built as a product of two graphs. That's so the main graph theory tool we are using is the Jigstra algorithm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All the questions? A short one from my side. Uh, what kind of uh, do you have uh, already some ideas on the use cases on which you you will you want to apply this uh, methodology, which is mm -hmm. uh, which is a generic uh, at least it is a target to be generic. Uh, the the first purpose is uh, in Nokia. There's a need of automatic passing because they receive so many logs like network logs, uh, network logs. Okay. and basically the, there's too many machines creating these logs, too many software, uh, too many templates, and these templates evolve all the time. So just to be able to analyze these logs, they need to have people manually writing regular expressions.
like so far that's the that's where log analysis starts uh, are you lucky enough to have a small network where you know all the kinds of machine all the kinds of message that, that produce or you're not really lucky there are thousands of templates and you need to hire someone to write regular expressions all day long so that's one of the use case and i think the pattern distance could also find use cases in bioinformatics because they use a lot of string alignment algorithms and i think it's an interesting generalization of this string alignment algorithm okay thanks so maybe we need to move uh... So I forgot to say to everyone at the end, uh, we will discuss a bit uh, some, some generalities about uh, your, your talks and some uh, some advice from, uh, from us. Uh, so next talk is from uh, Bharat Roy Choudhury. Yes. I hope I pronounce well, I don't know. <laughs> yes, I can I'll try to share my... Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll start now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bharat Roy Chaudhary, and uh, I'm a PhD student um, working with uh, François Bacelli and Bartek. Uh, this is the work that I'm presenting here. It is, uh, it is in collaboration with uh, François Bacelli. So this, this problem is related to the study of weak limit points of vertex shift properties. I will just describe what does it mean and uh, define it mathematically and possibly uh, explain in terms of uh, if there is any applications in the general context. Um, so this problem is uh, motivated initially by the, by the study of the navigation on uh, random objects in the sense that like if suppose if you have a random object or like a random point processes or a point processes or the random graph so if you you want to navigate on the points of this random object uh, so you want to study like how um, uh, you want to give some kind of algorithm or like a procedure deterministic rule where you can um, uh, and you want to uh, where you can deterministic rule for each realization, you give some kind of a rule and formulation, and uh, and you want to study like uh, different configurations, how well the algorithm behave or the rule behaves, like or uh, uh, by studying the local locality, how the the pathway, if you by applying this navigation, how it looks like. So for these cases, uh, navigation uh, uh, rules has been studied in point process by Charles Bodenau, François Bacelli, and Miromid using point shifts, uh, especially for Poisson point process, they were studied. And uh, later, uh, Miromid and uh, François Bacelli also studied using point shifts. Mm, but what we want to do here is to generalize uh, our mode, uh, and in analogy with uh, to the point process, we want to use the same similar results and to obtain a similar results for the navigation on the random graphs. Mm. For example, here I have given two. Uh, I have given two graphs here. Like for the the, the first graph shows, uh, is called the canopy tree of degree three. So in this canopy tree, this is an infinite tree. It has uh, infinite levels, and the, at each level there are um, uh, you see that the, here level zero there are elements, and it starts from level zero, and there and the level one, level two, and so on. Uh, at each level i, uh, you have uh, one. Uh, vertex which is standing next to adjacent to it and and it leads to the uh, the infinity in the sense of it has one end and the, below it there are two here the, there are two vertices so this is the true for all the vertices so you can give a navigation for example here i have given from the starting from the red vertex you can walk along this uh, the unique end uh, along this path uh, so th this kind of when you walk along this navigation path, like we want to study like how the uh, locality looks like instead of the neighborhoods uh, up while walking through this uh, the navigation path, like how the locality looks like. So here I, I talk about random graph. Like I, here I give another example where is the random graph means like uh, so you have a starting from the root, you have a Galton Watson tree, whether it is critical or subcritical hanging below you. 
and there is a unique path along this suppose the infinity path and you walk around you walk along this infinity path but the but this is a random graph in the sense that like the the vertices the edges change and they follow a distribution like galton version tree here uh, you want to we want to study like how by iterating this walk a navigation like what do you obtain by the, if there is an asymptotically so if you can and uh, you can use this uh, information to analyze uh, whether the algorithms works better or the deterministic rule that you define on the random uh, graphs uh, whether it is uh, you can compare between these two deterministic rules so this is the idea um, so the, the the more generally like it is uh, when you go to the I, I can i'll quickly pass through it because it's uh, maybe over the time um so quickly the the distribution so the random graph is uh, here is a uh, is is on taken on the space of equivalent classes of rooted graphs so these are all rooted graphs and uh, we define some equivalent classes and uh, by isomorphism and we a random graph is just a, a random rooted graph is just a probability distribution on this space so the navigation what we call here is defined by using this vertex shift so if by applying this vertex shift again and again iteratively so you get this sequence of random graphs and this i want to study whether they have the weak limits or possibly they have the single limit is a unique unique limit or not so we take more uh, so there, there were good results when you take the unimodular random graphs so unimodular random graphs behave better in the sense that many analogies from the point process transfers to the unimodular random graphs uh, these are the results that uh, for now we have obtained, like uh, for the case of finite orbits, suppose these are special cases, like for example, if you have finite orbits, in the sense that if you walk along this and you have only a finite, you re re recur to a same point after certain uh, n. Uh, the periodicity and evaporation, these are the three cases uh, when I, we have uh, explored. Uh, so. Well, um, for the the, bet, the good thing is like there are some if you have a if you walk through this uh, iteratively vertex shift you apply this. Uh, for the case of periodicity, if it is periodic, then you have a the limiting distribution is uh, absolutely continuous with respect to the starting random graph, and sometimes it if if it is uh, in the case of the operation it need not be the case it is absolutely it could be singular in the sense of the your measure is completely outside orthogonal to the initial measure that you started with so uh, i stop this these are some of the references here thank you well, thank you uh, so it was a bit more than, than 6 minutes for your okay very sorry uh, no, but, uh, well, I, I will say comments to everyone at the end because uh, there, there are some uh, some ideas that you you have to, you must have in mind when you prepare such kind of uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. So, any question in the audience? Uh, so, uh, I have one. Uh, short, short, be short in your answer. It's just a high level question. Uh, so, I see that it, it is a, some theoretical uh, work about uh, some properties in uh, to, to for the navigation in random graph. Yes. What, uh, what do you have some ideas of application, practical application of uh, of what you are doing? Uh, yes. Uh, for now, I can. Um, uh, uh, this are, I cannot see practical application, but the statistical application you can see. For example, there is some studies which are doing on the record uh, statistics. Suppose you have a sequence of uh, 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 sequence of time series. Uh, which have uh, uh, random variables like at each index, then you can define something called a record. Like once you, the first time you get, uh, you don't, the first time you get the maximum value. So you can keep defining as it a vertex shift, like in the sense of navigation here, you navigate to a point, like first time you have, you get the maximum value. So you have a time series and you move, keep moving like this. And then you can give a description of how this, uh, if it has a limiting distribution, like how the the structure gives. A, what the structure tells is that uh, how the records are uh, uh, dependent. The dependent structure can be seen. Okay, thanks. Thanks. So I think we need to uh, to go to the next uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, Michel Davidov.
a las dos. Okay. Can I start? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to present briefly the work that I do uh, during my PhD with uh, Francois Bacelli from uh, Ines Minria. Uh, so uh, the title, which uh, is about a point process based Markovian dynamics and their applications, is slightly more general than what I actually do, which is, uh, oops, uh, can. Uh, which is to be able to uh, understand uh, certain interacting particle systems that arise in computational neuroscience. And the idea is to use some novel methods from stochastic geometry and more uh, and other pro probabilistic methods to study this, these models in a, in a slightly new way. So the base model that we're studying is a network of K neurons. And so uh, interacting at random times. And so these random times obviously characterize entirely the behavior of the network. And the, uh, the relationship, uh, relationships between the times are given by a set of stochastic differential equations. So this model is called the galvez le Chabard model. And uh, the, our goals are to introduce uh, some computationally tractable models, so which are sort of caricatures of the GL model, but the character is not, a, in, a, not, not in a negative sense here and to prove certain properties in this model, such as propagation of chaos, which is a sort of, there's an element of scaling in the model. So propagation of chaos is about having asymptotic independence uh, as the scaling goes to infinity. And another goal is to study currently poorly understood uh, specific uh, galvez le Chabard models, which have a specific geometry, such as uh, cycles, for instance, and study the behavior of cycles. So the main, um, the main uh, object that I've been working with so is the replica mean field model. So given that the basic GL model, where I don't know if you can see my, my, my pointer, but so you have a network, or you have nodes that interact with interaction weights here. Uh, they're all equal to mu um, at random times. And so the classical, this, uh, the base behavior of the model is not compute, computationally tractable. And so the classical approach is to take the so-called thermodyn thermodynamic mean field limit or classical mean field limit, which is to take the number of nodes to go to infinity. And of course, to have the, uh, the weights, the interaction weights to be as in one over K in order for the behavior to be stable. And in this, uh, in, in this case, the geometry of the network is not preserved. Whereas in uh, replica mean field models, the idea is to take replicas of the initial network to randomly and uniformly route interactions between replicas instead of inside one replica. And uh, so this way, the number of uh, nodes is not scaled and the geometry of the network is preserved in some sense. And the goal is to study the infinite uh, replica limit when the number of replicas goes to infinity and to prove the so-called Poisson hypothesis, which is that the neurons become asymptotically independent and the arrivals process becomes a Poisson point process, which allows tractability. And so we've obtained that in both discrete and continuous time on compacts of time. So in discrete time, this has been uh, uh, even generalized to a more general, uh, to a general class of uh, processes, which we call phi apps, which include uh, galvez le Chabard models. And in continuous time, we have a proof for the Poisson hypothesis in a, and uh, the goal is to sort of generate to now go to into slightly different direction. And as I've mentioned, to study more cycles of uh, neurons without looking at to um, mean field models, to purely look at uh, like the existence and uniqueness of fixed points in cycles of galvez le Chabard neurons. Okay. So uh, thank you. Any, any questions? Thank you. Uh, less than four minutes. So bravo. <laughs> <laughs> It's not yet three minutes, but it's uh, quite good. Uh, so any question in the audience? Uh, what could be uh, the application of uh, your discoveries? Well, the, the, the application would be to provide, uh, like what I did was it sort of provide a rigorous, um, a rigorous proof that the, you, can, you can indeed uh, look at the infinite replica model as a new way of looking at certain networks. So I think that in, uh, I think that uh, so replica mean fields are used, could be useful uh, in applications where the geometry of the network 
is, a, uh, is of importance. So it's things like correlations due to finite size, which is like what prompted uh, the interest in these models in the case of computational neuroscience in the first place. So for other applications, uh, you, you, I, I saw maybe in terms of epidemiology, for instance, as soon as you want to consider um, the, uh, the geometry of your network and to simplify your initial model to, uh, to get, make it more, more computationally tractable, I think it could be interesting to, uh, could be an interesting tool to study those kind of models. I hope I have this answers your question. Other questions? Well, I have one. Uh, so I, I understood that uh, this could be applied to neuroscience. But uh, so my question is about the modeling that you applied. Uh, is uh, I'm a, it will be a bit naive because I'm not. Uh, I don't know many things about in uh, neuroscience, but neurons are usually they are structuring themselves. So is the, the is your model adapted to, to neuroscience and why? So, uh, so <laughs> neuroscience is not my specialty either. So, uh, but from what I understand, the idea is to uh, to look at the electric potential of the neurons. So we, and so they have uh, a spiking behavior. And so uh, the idea is to model these spiking times as random times, uh, as point processes. Or... But the, the question is, are they really random? <laughs> well, yes, apparently there is enough uh, variability for it to just to justify the, st okay. the looking at- uh, that, that was my question. Sorry. Yes, yes, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Other questions? So we, maybe we can move to the next speaker, uh, Saye. Yes, uh, let me share my screen. Okay. I think I share, yes. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I want to uh, explain my prop the problem that I work with Professor Bachelet from India. And uh, the problems that I work is um, based on the Markov chains uh, or the random sequence. Uh, and the, um, if we consider a, a Markov chain uh, Xn on the countable state spaces, uh, and uh, why we know the transition probabilities of this Markov chain. Uh, we know that because of the properties of the Markov chain, uh, we, uh, I could write a, st a recursive sequence for the Markov chain, as you see, I write it here. Uh, I, I could uh, write the place of the Markov chain as time n plus one uh, with a function of the uh, uh, place of the Markov chain at time n and uh, at time n, and the source of randomness that, that I have at time n, uh, which we know that for the Markov chain, the source of randomness are ID. Uh, and one question about this re recurrent sequence is that if this recurrent sequence, uh, recurrent se uh, recursive sequence have a, a stationary solution, I mean, uh, uh, if I have some random variable x uh, such that if I uh, uh, start the, uh, the dynamics that I have on the Markov chain uh, with uh, this distribution, uh, I, I, I got to the same distribution at the next time. Um, uh, you might know that the question, the answer of these questions for the Markov chains who are irreducible, aperiodic, and positive recurrence uh, is positive. Uh, and we know that in this case, there is a um, uh, there's the solutions uh, for this uh, for this equation for recursive uh, rec recursive sequence, uh, but for the uh, it's it meant that for the uh, positive recurrence there is a um, uh, there is a distribution on the states of the Markov chain that if we start with this distribution for, for the next time, uh, if we apply the Markov chain we have the same distribution, but the the answer of these questions for the non recurrent uh, sequence uh, for the non recurrent Markov chain uh, is no uh, in the sense that we don't have distribution to have this these properties, but but uh, but uh, but we know that um, it is true that there is no stationary distributions for the non recurrent Markov chain, but there is there is a stationary measure for the non recurrent Markov chain. It means that there is some measure on the states which is not distribution.
conditions is just measured the um, some some is that is that distribution in the sense that if I sums the mass of the um, of each point, uh, it is not finite. So I couldn't uh, I, I don't have the stationary distribution, but it is a stationary measure. Uh, and um, the questions that uh, we want to answer uh, is that uh, all, although we know that this refers to the question that doesn't have a solution for the non recurrent case, uh, because we know that there is a stationary measure for the uh, non recurrent Markov chain could be defined some um, measure valued process uh, that if um, th th this measure valued problems re relate to this recurrent Markov chain, not recurrent Markov chain, and in, if I apply this uh, measured valued process to the measures, uh, it, 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 the state of this, this uh, process, measure value process, gives me the stationary measure of the uh, non recurrent Markov chain. Uh, and uh, in the uh, um, Actually, we find these structures. Um, if I wanted to explain the, all the details about this, uh, the, this, uh, this, um, uh, this, this more. Let me. I couldn't see the. It's like, um, I I don't want to describe the um, the the dynamics uh, and the measure that we defined uh, precisely. But, uh, but I, if I wanted to, uh, to describe it uh, roughly, uh, for describing this, this, um, this dynamics, uh, I construct a graph. The graph is the graph that you see on the right side, the pictures. Uh, this graph is a random graph that the vertical line of this random graph is the state space of the Markov chains that we have uh, and we wanted to discuss about the measures on that. And the uh, horizontal line is the uh, time. Uh, and uh, the, the, the basic properties of this random, this, uh, I want to construct a random graph. The basic properties of this random graph is that uh, first, uh, I just have uh, some random uh, edges. Uh, this random edges uh, uh, is defined by the um, uh, rules of the Markov chain. Uh, the probability of going from I to J is the PIJ as you see in the pictures. Uh, and uh, the, the other properties of this graph is that I I, I fix some point, for example, here I, I fix zero uh, of the state space and I start all the passes from the zeros. Just I, I, as you see, I just have the passes that go, go some track back track to zero. And the other properties of this graph is that um, I merge the passes that uh, go to the one, to one point. For example, uh, if I wanted uh, uh, from each time t minus t, for example, to each time uh, minus t plus one, I have an edge with the proper with the uh, law of the Markov chain, and uh, when two passes uh, uh, meet each other, uh, I uh, I have uh, just one going out uh, edges from that point. It's a Dublin property. With the with the uh, with with this this random graph, uh, we const uh, we construct a, a random measure. As you see, at e at each at each time, I have some pointed. With this, this pointed are random because I have I construct some random graph, and at at each uh, uh, it, and this pointed help me to uh, define the uh, random measure that uh, I don't want to define it now. Uh, for example, suppose that I I define this random measure but by mu i j, uh, which the I is the, the index of time, and the J is the mass that I define for every point. And we could show that um, the, um, the, the, this graph gives me uh, for each at at each time to the next time. It gives me the. Uh, um, the law that I want for the dynamics, it, it defined that it defined that it, 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 if I have some measure at some time, how could I define the measure in the, in the next time? It gives me the dynamics, this, this graph. Uh, and uh, if I defined uh, in the, the measure in some, some with some properties uh, that this is the pre measure that we define at each time, we could show that the, the, this pre measure, the expectation of this pre measure is equal to the um, uh, invariant measure of the Markov chain that I construct the graph with. Uh, and the, the, the 
interesting things about this grant is that it is not only true for just for the non recurrent Markov chain and the, all things is true for the positive recurrent Markov chain. And it, this is the answer of the question that I, I ask here. Uh, I, I could, uh, with this graph, I, I define some. Um, and some uh, dynamics uh, that uh, this, the SDD state of this dynamic this dynamics is, is on, on the measure that because I, each, at each time I have some measure that we, I define it and it, so the next time it gives me another another measure and the, the and the stationary measure uh, that the SDD state or st stationary measure of this this graph is this uh, dynamics is the uh, invariant measure of the Markov chain. Um, the next things that are interesting about this this uh, this this construction and this measure that we, we construct is that is the um, pro, it, it, this construction gives gives us some uh, random graph that we know from before some properties of this random graph for the positive recurrent case, and we could answer some questions about this the properties of these random graphs in the non recurrent case, and also because of this this if you look at this this uh, theorem you see that the 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 expect I have I have some random measure that the expectation of this random measure is the uh, invariant measure of the Markov chain. Somehow, uh, because I have some random things that in expectation give me the invariant measure, it, it, gives, my, it gives me in some sense the um, perfect samples of this measure, the measure that I define on the construction. So um, you, yes. Uh, you, you should finish now, sorry. <laughs> it's finished. Okay. Yeah, I finished. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> okay, so you were. Uh, Maybe you just uh, work one sentence for conclusion if you want to conclude. Is it okay? Say it. Uh, so you finished, okay. Uh, so uh, time for one very short question. Uh, could you uh, explain uh, why such uh, measure could be useful? Uh, actually, the, I didn't explain, but this this visuals come from uh, in the um, th this visual actually was exist in the positive recurrent case, and helps people with some algorithm names coupling from the past to um, uh, to perfect samples from the positive recurrent Markov chain. Uh, we we use this graph to consider the properties of this graph. The properties of this graph for the positive recurrent Markov chain was unknown. But in the null recurrent Markov chain, uh, um, we didn't know the properties of this graph, and it, it's it's uh, this the, this view um, helps us to um, consider the properties of the graph, and because the graph is visual, is is help to construct this measure that um, the, the the measure that we have for the null recurrent the non recurrent Markov chain. Uh, at least we could show that in some special cases, for example, in the cases that the Markov chain is uh, monotonic, uh, with, we, with using this, this graph, the, because this graph uh, um, uh, at each step couples some uh, IID sequence, um, some uh, um, identi identical sequences. So it's, 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 it's help us to construct a measure at each point. Uh, we know that the, the measure that we construct have some uh, special properties that is equal to uh, a stationary distribution. And because of these visuals that we have and the coupling that we define at each time, we could construct it at least in some special cases locally, at least locally. Okay, uh, my question was actually more simple, but uh, we, we lack of time. Uh, my, my question was rather, does it help to solve new problems? Uh, do you have uh, applications in mind using this kind of measure? It was uh, rather uh, my question. I don't know if it's clear. Mm -hmm. The, the the main part was the study the properties of the graphs, the, and maybe the samplings of the um, uh, um, stationary measure of the Markov chain. The answering this question, if we could have some sampling. Um, the, the main question that it, it, it answered it was the one that I explained that if I could have some. Um, yeah, some uh, dynamics uh, 
that gives me the SCD states of that dynamics gives me the stationary measure of the network and Markov chain. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, not exactly, but uh, maybe we will discuss uh, when we will meet the, the next time uh, at links. <laughs> I think we really need to, to, to switch to the next and uh, I think last. But yeah. uh, perhaps a, a comment to answer it. I mean, yeah. uh, the, the objective is perfect sampling, as I said, to get a perfect sample of something as uh, one does in. in ah, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So this, this is rather the ki a kind of answer that I was expecting. Here, yes. uh, now I understand better. <laughs> It was, it was there. I mean, uh, she, that's what I explained at the end. It was that, uh, but uh, so uh, the answer is perfect sampling, right? So if you, if you want something practical and constructible, okay, okay. right? Okay. Okay. Which thank you, Francois. You're welcome. So next speaker, Pierre. Uh, yes. Okay. So I think I'm going to be uh, much shorter than uh, the previous one. So. I think when I tried to time myself, I was at two, two minutes and a half or three minutes. So uh, do you hear and see the screen correctly? Yeah, you can okay. So good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Pierre Popino. So I'm a PhD student under the supervision of uh, Francois Bacchelli. Uh, so I'm part of the Georgian team, which is a uh, joint between INRIA and INS. And my PhD is a part of the ERC NEMO network mobility. So funded by the European Research Council. Um, I'm going to discuss about my PhD subject, which links stochastic geometry and wireless networks. So I'm going to start by asking a simple question. What is the common point between the locations of trees in a forest, the infection loci in an epidemic, and users connecting to a wireless network? And the answer is that all these, mod all these uh, phenomena can be uh, modeled by spatial point process. So a spatial point process is just a random collection of points in the space in R2. Um, and it can be used to model a very large uh, array of physical phenomena, uh, both in statistical physics, in biology, and here in network theory. So <clears throat> the reason why stochastic geometry is very useful to model wireless networks is that for the next generation wireless network, we need to take into account layered and multitude networks, which can use a large um, array of frequency bands we have to take into account cross interference between the users that uh, arrive in the, uh, the network. We also have to design uh, association policies in order to um, correctly associate users with the tiers that they are meant to use. And we also have to model access rules. And all these different phenomena can be very easily modeled using uh, stochastic geometry tools. So it provides the very powerful and versatile framework to model um, a wireless network and it's very useful to get network properties. So why is it a versatile tool? Because uh, when you have a point process and stochastic geometry, you can do two things. So first you can do a stationary analysis of a point process, for example, to obtain network metrics or study the behavior of the typical point, the typical point, uh, meaning any point, what you can get, for example, uh, on average when the user connects to the, to the network. And so this side of stochastic geometry has ties with palm calculus and can also be linked to random graphs, which gives us a lot of tools to study uh, network metrics. The second thing you can do, and this is what Hubo um, presented earlier, is to do a dynamic analysis of uh, point process, which is called spatial birth and death processes. And it can be used, for example, to obtain stability criteria for um, a wireless network. We can also obtain the stationary distribution for users and um, this has ties to queuing theory and ergodic theory um, <clears throat> in probabilities. So using these two, uh, so we have two sites that we can study the wireless network and it's very flexible and very versatile in order to study thoroughly um, wireless network. So currently the work in progress that, uh, that I have is a first part, uh, which is a pure st uh, stationary analysis of a 5G network. So we have to model a multi-tier adaptive network um, and defining an association policy and to study the network properties. So this is a joint work currently um, with Sanket Kalamka and François Bakshali. And the second thing is the dynamic aspect of the, these wireless networks to obtain stability criteria when working with a multi-tier adaptive network and also to study the stationary distribution and to get, for example, deviation theory, uh, deviation theorems when studying the associated Markov chain. And so this is done under the supervision of Francois Bakshali. 
And so in the near future, the goal is to complete uh, these two works that can be um, used together in order to get a thorough description of a 5G adaptive network um, in a downlink setup. So this is, uh, so thank you for your attention. So this is the, uh, sorry, the, the message again. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for your attention. And so now I can take a few questions uh, to end the, the presentation. So thank you, Pierre. It was a bit less than four minutes for your yeah. information. Uh, so, and uh, bravo also. Uh, so any question in the audience? On my side, I have no question, but I'd like to congrac congratulate Pierre because uh, the presentation was uh, very well organized and very clear. So congratulations. Thanks. I join uh, Marco, uh, Marco Lidio also on that. <laughs> so uh, just a question for what is the yeah. next step uh, in your work? Uh... So the next step is right now we are designing some the main uh, so the main thing when uh, modeling the, this 5G network is a discussion that we had with people from the Cabell Labs yeah. and to design something which is called velocity-based association policies. And so uh, right now we are, I'm trying to, so I'm uh, in a step where it's the mess around to find out. So trying to design a good association policies for user when uh, designing a, a 5G network. So trying to, trying to find the best possible association policy that we have given some technical constraints. Uh, well, you also is good for me. It gives me uh, the, the, at the high level view of what you are doing. It's, uh, and it is the goal of this kind of uh, presentation. So, other questions? So thank you all. Uh, I will stop the recording now.